Um, so, you know, I'm a, um, a biological control research scientist who works at Rhodes University at the Center for Biological Control. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, biological control of cactus weeds today. Um, and just give you a few examples of like, some of the, the successes we've had. I'm going to show you some graphs and some data. Um, and then let you know where you can get your hands on these biocontrol agents if you need them. Um, so to start with, oh, you stuck there, Warren. So. Um, to start with, biological, um, alien invasive cactaceae are a huge problem in South Africa. They, um, they are very, very spiny plants. There are no indigenous cactus in South Africa, except for one obscure species of cactus, which is found up in the, the, the wild coast and up to, um, into the northern parts of KwaZulu Natal. And that's a, a cactus that doesn't have any spines and it grows in trees. So it's something that most people wouldn't recognize as a cactus. So every cactus in South Africa is in fact an alien plant. And many of them become seriously invasive. Um, because they're very spiny plants and they form these dense thickets, they um, reduce the carrying capacity of um, agricultural land arrangements. Um, and they stop the access or um, and movement of livestock um, and wildlife to things like important resources such as shade and um, uh, water um, resources. So they were really serious environmental and agricultural um, problems. Thankfully, biological control works really well for cactus. Um, and it, it's, it's, it, it works quicker with cactaceae than for nearly any other type of weed. Um, and it's very effective and environmentally friendly. So my first example is the example of the Puntia stricta. And this isn't actually in the Eastern Cape. We're going to start up in the Kruger National Park, but I'll be moving closer to the Eastern Cape soon. So in the Kruger National Park, before the release of the biological control agents, there were 30,000 hectares of the park that were inundated with a Puntia stricta. This is a plant from Mexico. Um, can you see in the photograph all of these red fruit on top of this dense infestation. Every one of those fruits is packed with seeds and all of those seeds are going to grow into new plants. An additional problem with cactus weeds is that each one of these um, cladoverts or pads, so one of the, the pads of the cactus is called a cladovert, each one of those will fall to the ground and produce roots and grow into a new plant. So dense infestations like this, and you can see there's a ranger standing in that thicket, um, we're really reducing the movement of all wildlife through these areas um, out-competing and displacing indigenous biodiversity, including plants. Um, and, of course, we, all South Africans here, and we know how important the Kruger National Park is, this is absolutely unacceptable to have over 30,000 hectares of the park. So the solution in this case was a biological control agent. Um, it's a type of insect called a cochineal insect. And underneath each one of these little bits of white fluff, there's a little red insect that puts its mouth parts into the plant and it sucks the juices out of the plant for it to survive. It also injects a poison into the plant that makes it easier for it to digest. And there's a whole lot of different species of cochineal, and this is one that is particularly damaging and um, specific to the Puntia stricta. So the cochineal insect also comes from um, Texas, where the Puntia stricta comes from. So this is a, a photograph taken in 1993 before the release of the biocontrol agents. There's many photographs like this. This is just one of my favorites. You can see a large thicket of um, the Puntia stricta. And you can see these two little white lines on the tree at the back there. After the release of the biocontrol agent, there was an absolute collapse. This is the same place. You can hardly see the, the, um, the marks on the tree because it was taken 10 years later. Um, but you can see that the whole thicket has disappeared. Except for we've got two little Puntia stricta plants there. And that's the thing about biological control. You can never aim to eradicate the plant completely with biological control. You want to reduce it to below some sort of damage threshold. In this case, this plant is no longer a problem. Every time the Puntia stricta comes back and starts increasing in its abundance, the cochineal insect is going to catch up with it and get on top of it again. So it's not just the photographs that we have to, to show evidence for the success. We've also got some long-term data. It started way while I was at school back in 1992, and the work was actually done by um, John Hoffman, whose paper I have cited down there. You just can't see it. This was a paper I wrote way later using the same data. 
So, um, th in this graph, we start in 1992 and we go up till um, 2013. But in fact, um, the recent publication has taken this data all the way up to 2020, and now we've stopped the long term monitoring at this um, plot. So, in 1992, the bar control agent hadn't been released yet. The density of the cactus in Cladro to Pumita squared, so the colors again on the pads, um, is uh, the dark line over here. And you can see that there were somewhere in 1992, somewhere around 20 to 25 pads per meter squared on average in the areas where this was done. So it's a massive amount of cactus. And that was during quite a dry period. In a wetter period that started in 1996, it increased to about 35 up to even like 40, 45. Um, uh, Cladons per meter squared on average, so incredibly dense. The bark control agent was released in 1997. This is that cochineal insect. And at first, it looked like we were doing quite well. This is the relative abundance of cochineal given here, and the population of the cochineal started to increase. And then it decreased again. At this stage, we were very disheartened. But that was because it was a really, really wet time, and cochineal doesn't establish really well at wet times, so it took a bit of time before it got going. When it did get going, in about 2000, there was a massive spike in the abundance of cochineal, and this is associated with a huge decrease in the average density of the plant in the Kruger National Park. Now, the important things that I want you to take away from this graph is, first of all, that it took some time, and there's a bit of variability after you've released the biocontrol agent. It doesn't always work like that. The second thing that I, there's three things. The second thing I want you to take into account here is that we're looking at years, not weeks and months. It's not like a herbicide, it takes a lot of time. But the really important thing is that this line, the, 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 the density has been decreased and it's remained decreased and it will remain like that forever. It's never going to increase back to the levels that it was at. It never goes to zero, but it's never going to get back up to the problem. So we've decreased this, this problem to below a damage threshold where it will remain permanently. So I said I'd bring this to the Eastern Cape. A plant restrictor is also a major problem in the Eastern Cape. And this is just some recent data that's been collected within the last four years within the Eastern Cape where we've done releases of this biological control agent. Um, the, the, on, again, we've got the density of the cactus or the number of fruits. Um, uh, up on this axis. Um, so the number of cladodes is in the white bars, the black bars are the number of fruits, and then the third, what looks like a black bar from where you're sitting, I'm sure, is actually the amount of cochineal. So each time interval is six months, and basically the, the story is exactly the same as what's happened in the Kruger National Park. We've had a decrease in the white bars to much lower levels, so there's far fewer um, cladodes, there's less biomass of the cactus, also, on average, there were over 120 fruits per plant before bar control was released. And after bar control, it's hovered at about 20 on average, in some years, even as low as sort of five. And this, I believe that in time, we're going to get even better control. I think we're still on a bit of a downward trajectory here. But the important thing is it's never going to get back to what it was before. So control is permanent. We have different cochineal species for different cactus species. Um, this is a Pantia monocantha, the drooping prickly pear. It's the first ever bar, um, uh, weed that was targeted for biological control um, in South Africa. So this agent was released way back in 1913. And at that stage, large parts of the Eastern Cape, farmers had actually abandoned their land completely because of how densely this plant was growing on the farms. A different species of cochineal um, was introduced and it um, completely has um, reduced the, the, the cactus problem to the point that it is no longer a problem as long as you've got the cochineal there. So at sites where there was very little or no cochineal, we've released um, at, at, I think this is from about um, eight or nine different sites in the Eastern Cape province. Um, and you can see again the number of colors reducing the number of fruits reducing dramatically and the number of cochineal increasing and then coming down with the, um, the density of the plant. So those were two um, Puntia species. This is Sirius Chimekuru, one of the many cacti that are called Queen of the Night Cactus. And we've got a different biocontrol agent for this species. Um, it's called Hypergeococcus and it's a, it's a galling mealy bug species. So although it looks like it's got white fluff on it, it's actually a very different insect to a cochineal insect. It, it forms a gall or a, a kind of like a tumor on the plant. And you can see what the first thing that this 
that this um, agent does. So this is a plant before biocontrol. This cactus reproduces almost entirely by fruit. It doesn't break up into bits easily like the Apuntia cacti. You can see all of these fruits, all packed with seeds, birds are going to eat those and distribute them. That's the main way that this plant reproduces. After the release of the biocontrol agent, we've just got these large balls all over the plant, there's not one fruit on it. So the first thing that this biocontrol agent does is with, as soon as it becomes abundant in a site, which takes about a year for it to spread within a site, it will completely eliminate all production of fruit. It then starts killing the smaller plants. So here you can see a, a, the, the remains of a dead plant, which is actually quite big, it's taller than Pippa and Zeze over there, um, who were doing some monitoring um, at this site. And you can see that that plant has been completely killed by the biocontrol agents. And then even after a few years, even big trees like this are completely killed by the biological control agents. So although it takes about eight years to get permanent control, the control is permanent after that. If you disrupt this process with um, um, herbicide applications, for example, you're at risk of killing the um, biological control agent, um, which will result in um, a few plants escaping from it, producing seeds and um, producing um, uh, more plants. Okay, some, some cacti are easier to control than others. If you're from the Eastern Cape, you'll know Kaki. This is a um, jointed cactus, Apuntio orantiaca. You don't often find infestations quite as dense as this. Um, this uh, plant is, is, a, is a terrible weed. You can imagine the farm here, nothing can move through there. Um, just outside of Makanda, where I'm based, there's a, a farmer who, who has, has sheep. And he says that he once brought in sheep from an area where there was no jointed cactus. He put them on his farm and a whole lot of them died because they got stuck in, this, in, in the cactus. His sheep had learned that you keep away from it. So that whole area that, where the cactus is, is even a little bit dense is left alone completely by the, um, um, by the, um, the sheep. It means that it's, it's a, a waste of space to the farmer. And it's just a place for the uh, jointed cactus to breed. Now, this one, we don't have as spectacular levels of control using a biocontrol agent, but we, we have improved the situation dramatically. Before the biocontrol agent was released, and it's another species of cochineal, before it was released, there were many places in Eastern Cape where farmers had to put up ramps over infestations like this to get their small livestock to water sources. You hardly ever see that anymore, because there is a lot less jointed cactus. But it is still a major problem. And we've done releases at hundreds of, of, of jointed cactus um, sites um, where we've tried to either introduce or augment the populations of the bar control agent. Now the bar control agent is actually quite widespread, but often it needs a bit of a kickstart to start doing its job. Um, so this is an example where I've just got eight of the sites. And basically, this is the release point at time zero where we released on that site. And anything below that line is the percentage less of of the cactus that there was afterwards. And we're monitoring here up to 40 um, months after the release. So what I want you to take home from this um, data is that in, in all eight of these sites, there is less of the cactus after the biocontrol agent has been released. These three sites, looks like it's coming up. Maybe we need to release at these sites again. At other sites, and all of these sites were treated completely the same. At other sites, we've got really, really good success. And this is probably to do with the weather. Cochineal likes it when it's hot and dry, um, but when you release the, the cochineal insect, you, you want healthy plants. So it needs to spread and then have a hot dry period, and then it really, really does well. But overall, on average, we have reduced it from 31 kilohertz per meter squared to about 18 per meter squared. So not complete control, but it's definitely worth having the agent there if you haven't got it there already. And this is just an example of the place where the biocontrol was, was, was um, uh, completely absent and we released very recently. Um, this is up in the Kruger National Park. Um, and it was only five months ago that we released the biocontrol agent and I was up there monitoring um, a little while ago. And in that five months there's been a 61% reduction in the area cover of the, the jointed cactus. And the average plant size has gone from 14.5 to 4.7. Um, cadets per plant. So they're, they're much smaller and they're far fewer. They're about a third of the plants that were there um, five months ago. So we do have spectacular successes if we've got really um, 
uh, good weather conditions after the release. So I think the secret of the jointed cactus is release as much as you can, as often as you can, and try and release before um, hot, dry um, periods. This, this is a bunch of guinea fusa. Um, there's a, another cochineal insect that's used to control it. It's a creeping cactus that grows along the ground. Um, the photo is a bit of a, taking a bit of a tip, but I like the photo because I released one cladda with cochineal over here. And you can see that, the, it, you can see everything there is the cactus. The line of cochineal marching along, killing the cactus. And this was just a couple of months after the, um, the release was, was done. And that's in exactly the same spot now. I searched through there and I couldn't find any cactus. So it's actually been completely eliminated from this patch. And because there was um, a dead cactus there, grass has grown um, on the site. So that was a, a, a very nice success. So for creeping cactus, a bunch of hemifusa, we should get good control if we have the correct biocontrol that it released um, in the right densities. And then uh, another very difficult one, Cylindropunti imbricata, the devil's rope cactus. Uh, this is a, a site just outside of Graf Um Obviously devastating to the farmer, a very spine horrible thing. That's at the same site um, about a year and a half after the release. Uh, so we, we don't normally get success as quickly with, with this um, cochineal, but it had been a very good season for it. Um, you can see all of these tall plants have been completely denuded. All of the small plants are absolutely covered. You can you see the white color on them? That's all cochineal. So all of these plants are definitely going to die. Um, the secret with um, Cylindra Punti and Ricarta is that, and what we didn't do at this site, and what we, we did ask the farmers to do, but it didn't happen, is that when the plant gets absolutely covered in cochineal and it starts dropping its colors, you actually want to send a team in to cut down the larger plants because of the resources in the stem. The cochineal will never kill the, the, the full stem, but if you cut it down and leave it where it stands, it becomes a little mass rearing um, uh, station for the cochineal, and um, then you can get really good control. And then Boxing bird cactus, Cylindropuntia um, fulgida or mammalata, and the normal um, fulgida or fulgida. This is the one that's more problematic in the Eastern Cape. We have a bar control agent that really should be eliminating uh, your cactus, almost completely wiping it out uh, within a year or two. Um, and these are just some before and after photos. This was taken about a year and a half afterwards. You can see all of the cactus is dead there. Okay, and then finally, um, this is Cylindropuntia pallida. Um, we have different cochineal species for all of the other um, uh, cacti that I've talked about so far in this talk. Uh, for this one, we haven't had one until very recently. So the cochineal insect is in quarantine at the moment. We got it from Australia, where it's been used as a biocontrol agent. So the plant and the agent originally come from Mexico. You can see if you haven't come across this plant in the field, you, you won't miss it if you walk into it. It's one of the spiniest cacti that I've ever worked on, and it's, it can be very, very problematic. And in Australia, they've had massive success. This was um, a year and a bit after the release of their biocontrol agent. All of their plants are dead, and we've, we've got this in quarantine. We have permission to release it, and it will be leaving quarantine hopefully in the next two weeks, and we'll be releasing it um, soon. Um, so, basically, I, I manage a, a small team of people um, with the, the funding um, from Debbie's team at um, DFFE. And they um, basically farm a power control agents on as large a scale as we possibly can. And we provide them to the public um, and to anyone who needs them. Um, and then if the, the site is close enough, we get out there and, and do some monitoring so that we can monitor success. So if anyone's interested in, in cactus problems or would like to get hold of biological control agents, you can get hold of me at this email address um, and I'm, I'm very happy to answer questions about cacti and also provide you with any biocontrol agents. And you'll also be able to get these biocontrol agents um, through um, Abby, who's the, the, the DFFE coordinator for um, the, the Eastern Cape. Professor, is there, are there any questions for Professor Patterson? All right, we're going to start. Let's start with. with uh, start with Debbie. All right. Um, sorry, Ian, can you please just be very clear and say to everybody don't move your cochineal on your own. We don't want cross hybridization. 
Yes, that's something that is a very good point. Thank you very much, Peggy. Um, I, I talked a few times about how we've got different species of cochineal. If you take the wrong species of cochineal and you put it on the wrong cactus, in some cases it'll survive, but it's only going to just survive. In most cases it will die, but it's not going to kill the cactus. So I often have people who've got uh, lots of cochineal on their um, Apuntia antiarca and they want to get rid of their Apuntia stricta. It, the, they look exactly the same to us. You have to get the fluff off them in the microscope to see the difference. But if you use the wrong cochineal, then you're, it's, it's not going to work. <coughs> So we need to use the correct ones. And it's going to bugger everything. In some cases, it can um, hybridize with other cochineals and result in it being very difficult to control that cactus. So um, it's it's if you and and I encourage people to to move cactus move move cochineal, but only once they've spoken to someone uh, who, who can advise them, someone from DFF or someone from Rhodes. Um, we can provide you with the correct agents and we can tell you whether the agent that you want to redistribute is the correct one or not. But if you just do it, um, you may get it wrong and it might make things more difficult for you. We'll get to you now, just gentlemen. I just wanted to ask about Ficus indica. It's probably the most decent case species I can think of and no mention. Um, and just, yeah, from an ecological background, um, I've never found, I've only found Ficus indica growing in areas that are disturbed um, and I've never, I don't know, I've never thought of it as such a bad uh, in Bay compared to maybe some of the other uh, punches or, or <coughs> I, I, you can prove me wrong happily, um, but that's just my kind of observations from in the field. I'm on the Pantia Ficus indica. Specific, specific. Okay, so I, I, I think the Pantia Ficus indica does definitely get into pristine um, bush. I've seen lots of examples of that happening. And there are some patches where it is a really bad weed. Um, we estimate that there's 90% less Antiophycus indica in the country as a whole um, than there was before the bar control agent was released in the 1930s. I think um, Debbie had a photo in her, her um, a presentation where she showed a photo before and after biological control. Um, uh, and so, so there's, there's a lot less of it, and it's also a plant that is valued. So in the places where you find uh, a lot of ficus indica, it's normally an area that gets a lot of mist, which the cochineal doesn't like, and it's also often within very dense um, uh, thicket vegetation. So the cochineal disperses by just like blowing in the wind. It's useless disperser. That's why we have to have a mass rare facility to make it and get it and redistribute it all over the country. Um, so that it doesn't disperse well in those um, sort of habitats. And um, we do redistribute the ficus indica cochineal when we, when we get requests for it. Uh, we don't get nearly as many requests for that as the other cacti. And I think that's because um, in a lot of cases it's, it's not such a bad weed, and also because it is really valued a lot of the time. Um, but, but if we didn't have the bar control agent, we would be swimming in the stuff. Just an interesting note, when I was doing work in Colchester before they opened it to Ada, um, the first thing that disappeared was because you can get the back after the left. So that's another thing, biocontrol agent you can consider in the future. Are, are you suggesting elephants? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> if you've got elephants, you don't have any practice in the But interestingly enough, they do spread the Pantia stricta. Yes. So, yeah. Um, my question is, is regarding the movement thing about the cochineal. Uh, we've got a, a farm of about 11,000 hectares, and you know, the, the, it's a, a puntia umifiza that becomes these clumps, but you'll find like one clump on a hectare, for example. Um, is it necessary to actually move the cochineal to new clumps, or how? And if it does, how do you do they dispose? Say if there's one clump here and one clump at the door, maybe. So, Yumi is the one that requires the most help because it grows so flat. So, you can imagine a tall cactus is going to get a much more space for the, the crawlers, the dispersal phase of the cotton to blow in the wind. So, if, like um, up at Timberwati, they've got a big problem with Yumi Fusa. And about the toilet, it works really well, but it's in grass like this. So you have to actually move it to nearly every patch. But in uh, the Cane Peru, where there's far less vegetation in between it, it, it will travel. Um, when you release it, try and release it um, at the sort of at the top of the infestation so that the prevailing wind will be blown over the infestation, and that helps. 
But also what you can do, and I think this is a secret with, with most Cactus Bar Control, release the agent in a spot so that you consolidate it and it's there. And if it's at a place that you're going back to often, you can move it. So whenever you've got a lot, you move it. And the more you help it, the, the, the better level of control you'll get, and the quicker. Any more questions for the professor? Done. Thank you very much. That was very, very exciting.